Do you know how to choose a safe and effective CBD or cannabis product for your dog? What about the endocannabinoid system and why you need to know about the hundreds of other minor cannabinoids and not just CBD and THC? What about how to start a conversation with your veterinarian about the introduction of CBD into your dog's treatment or wellness plan? Well, I spoke with Dr. Kasara Andre, a veterinarian leading the way in the cannabis space about all things CBD and cannabinoids so that you can get the most out of these powerful treatment options while also keeping your dog safe at the same time. I'm really excited for our conversation today and it's been a little bit kind of some time in the making with holidays and things um, and the reason I'm so excited is because kind of cannabis, CBD, marijuana, it's it's an area that's exploded in growth and interest um, among vets, pet parents and marketers as well and maybe we'll touch on that a little bit later but I'd love to know what got you interested in this field in particular? Absolutely. Thanks, Alex. I'm really excited for this conversation and glad that we finally were able to make it work. <laughs> that was a little bit challenging to find the time. Um, let's see how I got started with cannabis. I, I think all of your audience will know the feeling of we, we look for things for our own animals first. And that was definitely, definitely what brought me into this field. Um, I had a cat who was 17 at the time and really just struggling with IBD all of her life, um, a couple of behavioral disorders, um, but iffy kidneys, so all the stuff that all of her old kitties are struggling with. And I was really looking for some good pain medication options for her as well as just some GI support. And I just didn't feel like I had what I was looking for. And um, at the same time, I was starting to help a friend explore medical marijuana for their father, for a human, human friend. Um, and of course I just thought to try it on my own animal. So I saw such a dramatic difference for her changed her life, um, had amazing years with her that I never, never thought I would just because she was kind of at that point where there's not a lot you can kind of do to make that better. And they kind of start on that decline. And yet cannabis for her was absolutely life-saving. And the last years of her life were not just years, but really, really good years with her sitting in the garden, climbing up on stuff she shouldn't have. So it was definitely, definitely my heart cat that brought me into cannabis, like most other things in my <laughs> profession. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Cause at 17, that's, you know, all we want is maybe a little bit more time with, you mm -hmm. know, a good quality of life, isn't it? So to have that yeah. dramatic result is, is fantastic. Yeah, it was mind blowing. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're talking there about kind of cannabis and, and medical cannabis, and I'm sure a lot of people will have heard about CBD um, and then marijuana, and is that the same as cannabis? And and where does CBD come into it? And hemp products, like help help us understand, yeah, you know, question. what all these different <laughs> things are, because it can it can be very confusing. Absolutely, but it is a really great place to start for anyone who's beginning to be interested in cannabis or just getting their toes in the water, because knowing your terminology makes everything make a lot more sense. Now it will depend which country you're sort of working within. Some of the countries have different policies that will define cannabis, hemp, marijuana, but I'll talk about what we're, what we see here in the States and I'm practicing out of Colorado. So this applies to us as well. Cannabis is the overarching term for the plant. So the genus is cannabis. And so whenever I'm talking about cannabis, you'll notice that I'm pretty careful to use it in that more encompassing comes from this genus of plants. And then I become more specific of hemp, which means that it is, it just isn't going to have as much THC. It's usually grown for different purposes than the medicinal molecules from it. And then marijuana is a side that has a lot more THC. So you'll see that through the dispensaries, um, more highly regulated, but usually I'm talking about cannabis just as um, cannabis derived molecules because from a clinical perspective, what I really care about is what are the molecules that end up in the product? It doesn't actually matter to me too much. Um, if it comes from a hemp plant or a marijuana plant, some access rules can apply there. But from a medicinal perspective, it's really about which molecules end up going in the patient. Cool. And that THC, that's a kind of psychotrophic, psychoactive component that, that causes you to get high if, if you yeah. like yeah. So one of the actually hundreds of molecules that the cannabis plant makes in that group of cannabinoids. So THC is one of them. CBD is one of them. CBDA. So the acid has an acid group instead of um, we sort of make it fall off from to make CBD. So there's hundreds and hundreds of cannabinoid molecules. And we just kind of know about those two prominent ones. That's what's in all the news and all the media and everyone's really excited about. There's actually a lot of minor cannabinoids that we're finding 
a lot of use for clinically. They're really, really fun to work with. Okay. Oh, cool. So, and, and are they like, how, how different do like maybe CBD oil products, um, you know, well, how do they differ from the, the ones with THC? Do they have all of the other cannabinoids in them or is there a, a marked difference in, in what that profile is? It's kind of uh, anybody's game. <laughs> It's actually really hard to know what's in the product because not all of the industry comes at this from a a medical minded perspective. Um, Any pet parent who's beginning to dabble in the cannabis realm will know that sometimes pretty marketing or pretty branding is really what tries to win the day. And when you really try to drill down and see which molecules are actually in this product, what's actually contained in it, sometimes it can be really tough to find, to find out. So what we ask for from a medical perspective is a certificate of analysis. It's just like asking for blood work on a patient to know where all of your internal organs, how they're working. So same thing. We ask for a COA certificate of analysis on every product that we're going to work with, or the pet parent wants to bring in. And essentially that answers the question that you said, what molecules are in here, whether it came from the hemp side or the marijuana side, it doesn't really matter until you see that COA for the product that's actually going to be administered. And then you know which molecules you're working with. Sure. And I think some, some certainly websites, I mean, a lot of people shop online and, you know, mm-hmm. CBD for my dog is probably a pretty common Google search. If, if we're looking yes. in this area, <laughs> yes, a, lot, so. a lot of websites <laughs> will have that kind of prominently displayed or they'll have an FAQ or something with that uh, analysis, an ideally independent analysis on there. Yes. What, what kind of things should they be looking for? I mean, it's often it's, it's, it's highlighting the THC component to prove that it is a CBD rather than a, a, another product, isn't it? What's all in there. Yeah. yeah. Well, I will say first off, if you find the COA prominently displayed, that product already, already gets a gold star. <laughs> They're already high on the list in my book because it really is a good defining factor. If you can't find a COA or you can't get one just by calling or emailing, if it's, if it's hard, you know, if you have to dig through a bunch of layers, I would, I would look for a different product. There are a lot of companies that are great doing a great job out there and making that lab result really available. So if you can't find it, just switch to a different product. Um, and so, yes, the, the molecular profile, the molecules that are actually in the product is a prominent piece of the COA, but even more than that is probably the freedom from information. So is it free from heavy metals? Is it free from pesticides? Is it free from mold bacteria? Those are things that you'll also find on the COA and together that lack of the bad and then which molecules you're actually using you, you really need both of those together to give you a clinical picture of what it's going to do in the patient. Yeah, sure. So as well as, uh, I guess, uh, uh, letting you know what it is, it's a quality control to let you know that yes. it's, it's, it's safe from that point of view. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, re- regarding kind of safety, because I know people will have, you know, potentially concerns of, about things. What uh, is, are there any safety concerns? I mean, if I think, you know, the last time I saw a dog who'd got into their owner's pot stash it was you know <laughs> peeing all over the place it was falling you know nodding off falling asleep and twitching um but you know ultimately was was absolutely fine are there any kind of other safety concerns that people need to be aware of or maybe other medication reactions that kind of thing yeah what a great question from all aspects both from the practitioner side but also mm. just for pet parents to be aware i will first say that that intoxication that most of us are familiar with from a veterinary perspective that's a lot of THC. Usually that's when an animal gets into someone's stash or um, picks something out of the trash can and hundreds of milligrams of THC. When we're working with THC therapeutically, we're on a much, much smaller, the other side of the spectrum, and you really don't see those effects. In fact, most of my cases have to have some THC in them because it's a pretty powerful molecule. So it's all in, like all, like all medicine, it's about the balance more than the individual molecules themselves. Um, So aside from put your stash where your dog can't reach it, (laughs) that'd be the number one safety piece. It is looking in the COA. So making sure there's not those contaminants that are in there. And then recognizing that these molecules do actually have a, a lot of power within the body, particularly now as we begin to understand what the endocannabinoid system is and how many things in the body it controls, everything from um, sleep, memory, learning, appetite, um, social anxiety in humans, some behavioral disorders in our animals, just so incredibly important to mammalian health and well-being. 
that when we begin to add molecules into an animal's regimen, we need to recognize that there can be a lot of interactions. So CBD in particular, one of the cannabinoids that cannabis produces, it actually is a really um, important competitive inhibitor of cytochrome P450. So that's a molecule in the liver that metabolizes almost 60% of our pharmaceutical drugs. So if an animal is on pretty much any other medication, it's important that everyone just be aware that there's a potential for potentiation. Do you know what I mean by that? It could just make the effects of those medications stronger because that um, enzyme that would normally metabolize that drug, it's working on other things. So the drug is just going to stick around a little bit longer. Yeah. We think yeah. about, um, making sure the molecular profile matches the animal's personality. So even if uh, we are going to use some THC, but we have a really, really anxious dog, we might approach it really, really slowly and ramp up over time. Um, and then making sure that we are evaluating periodically. So what we do in our consulting practices, have the pet parent go check in with their primary care veterinarian in four weeks after starting a product. And then again, at 12, Cannabis has proven itself incredibly safe, but we still want to check for liver values and um, renal health. Just make sure that everything is as it should be and we're not missing anything. Fantastic. So what I'm hearing you say is that this isn't a product that I jump online, go and buy and start and just kind of freestyle it and do my own thing at home. Like there's, <laughs> you know, there's quite a little bit to this. If we, you know, and, and it may be that people have got bought CBD oils and and they're doing that and they're going well you know there's no problem I'm, I'm doing fine there might be something going on under the scene or mm -hmm. it might be that we're not getting the best benefits that we can from these products yeah I think that's a great way to say it that if you do have an animal that has an underlying condition or is on other medications you could have some complications or as you said you might just not be seeing the effects that you could be because the molecular profile isn't exactly matched for that patient yeah wonderful um so if we're moving kind of onto the, the treatment side of things, because there are a whole load of claims for, you know, if you jump on, you so know, maybe, maybe not in the scientific community, but on <laughs> Facebook and, you know, wherever people, you know, do their research for, yeah. you know, it cures everything. It does. It, it, it's, it's a, a wonder drug that, that yeah, is, is responsible for amazing cures and is the only thing people need to, to be giving their mm -hmm. pets. But, you know, maybe let's break down what conditions we know it is, you know, appropriate for, and then I don't know, are there any, is there anything on the horizon that we may be, you know, maybe coming, you know, too soon? Yeah. What an exciting area to begin broaching now because cannabis medicine is finally kind of getting to that point where we know our molecules, we understand, beginning to understand the system they're working on, that it really is a time when we can begin making some educated predictions about which molecules will, will work well, which ratios of molecules together work for certain conditions. But you're right. I will say that when I started working on cannabis the first time or kind of that season of my life, the thing that irked me the most that I found most annoying was CBD for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Everything needs CBD. And just from a medicine perspective, that's not, that's just not how biology works. We don't see that hundred percent across the board. But at the same time, as I began to learn more about the endocannabinoid system, so the system within every mammal's body that the cannabis molecules are working on, it actually begins to make a little bit more sense why we see so many different conditions respond to cannabis drive molecules. And really that comes down to understanding what the endocannabinoid system is and what it's meant to do and how these molecules from the outside can support that system in its own function. So essentially the ECS or endocannabinoid system is responsible for homeostasis in the body, responsible for balance. And so if that system is out of whack, you will see clinical signs. Um, in humans, there's actually a diagnosable uh, endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. So it's linked closely to IBS, Crohn's disease, anxiety disorders. And when you supplement with a cannabis product, you really see those clinical signs resolve. Now we don't know that for sure in animals, but I think that we'd all be uh, not the curious scientific thinkers that we are if we weren't thinking that this could be something that we see in our animals as well. Yeah, so hey, you saw it in your, you saw it in your cat potentially as well, who had the IBD and, and, you know, years later was doing, you know, very well in very old age. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's really true from a clinical perspective, those cases that really are just not responding well to a more Western approach or uh, maybe a little bit more conventional approach. 
those are usually the ones that respond really well to cannabis. And so we're beginning to think about uh, not so much taking a molecule and just making a system do something, but more switching our focus and saying, maybe this endocannabinoid system needs more support. And that's how, that's what we're actually trying to do with cannabis. All that to say, we can actually see cannabis work really impressively in a lot of various conditions, but you know what, if you break your leg, you're still going to have to go to surgery. (laughs) So there are some things that cannabis is not going to fix. And there are some cases where we need to think about how we use it, especially in our little patients, um, patients with renal disease, cardiac disease, other medications on board, things like that. So yes, absolutely. Cannabis makes a huge difference in a lot of cases, but when we really drill down to what can we really use it well for there are some particular ones that spring to the surface. So I guess I'll just pause for that because that was more about endocannabinoid system questions or comments on that. And then I can talk more about. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's, I I, I think you're right that the understand, well, it's one, it's a very exciting time because it seems to be that we've gone from a lot of, you know, fluff and, um, you know, people shouting on loud hailers to actually a lot of, you know, research being, um, you know, in the process and in the pipeline and actually results coming out to to prove that it is a beneficial product. So, you know, how, how exciting is that we get another tool in our arsenal potentially to, to use yeah. to help our, you know, our, our, pet, pet, our pets and yeah, what could be better than that? So yeah. I guess I, you know, uh, I'm kind of watching from afar because we don't have access to a lot of these products here in New Zealand at, at the moment. Hopefully that will change, but I've seen, um, you know, evidence in, in pain and seizures, I guess has been mm-hmm. the prominent ones, anxiety. There's a whole, whole range of things, isn't there? Absolutely. Well, you have some exciting stuff going on in New Zealand at the moment. Hopefully y'all will be having access to products soon. So that's, that's exciting to see. I agree. I think that pain is probably the number one thing we see pet parents reach out for to, to work with cannabis for. Sometimes this is because it's been effective for their own pain. And that's a big reason that a lot of pet parents pursue any modality for their animal is it helped me. And I want that same relief or that same um, benefit for my animal. So pain probably being the number one. And I would say if there's a cannabis is probably going to work pain is a good one to pick. It has so many different interactions on so many different systems, inflammation, perception of pain, um, worry about pain. Some of those social anxiety components. If I'm a painful older dog and I have a young animal in the house, I don't, don't touch me. You might hurt me just working on some of those holistic aspects. Um, pain is probably the number one that's easy to work with with cannabis seizures or neurologic disease is probably next. We have some actually really good papers out of CSU, Colorado State University, talking about use of hemp in seizure disorders and seeing a lot of improvement there. Then probably I would say cancer is the next one that people reach out for help with cannabis on. And Alex, this is where we kind of get into the, you can do it on your own, But if you really want to have definitive care of cancer, you really need to be thinking about which molecules are in the mix, what the ratios between the molecules are, how it's administered, kind of how it's titrated up. So for us, we have um, Dr. Trina Hazah, who's an integrative oncologist, um, working with our team who essentially will look at a case, help make a molecular profile, and then we can help the pet parent find those products. But we see some amazing results from an oncology level it just, it takes a lot more care. There's a lot more need that goes into knowing what your molecules, molecules are. Yeah. And then for me, I would say last is probably uh, behavioral disorders. That's, that's my area of professional interest. Um, separation, anxiety, anxiety in animals, PTSD in animals, emotional trauma in animals. We see cannabis bring some amazing healing properties to the table. Same thing as in for humans. So I mentioned that last, but I'll have to say that that one's probably <laughs> the nearest <laughs> and dearest to my heart. Yeah. And it's something that we're seeing quite a lot of across the world with everything that's gone on in the last couple of years. And we'll see the yeah. ramifications of that in the, in, for many years to come, I think. So, you yes, know, what a great I thing agree. for people to, to reach for when it comes to, so we've already kind of said, you know, don't just necessarily go and buy the first product you, you, you find online and work with your, your vet, but should we be thinking about using these products in conjunction with our existing conventional medicines? Because I guess my concern is that people go, oh, I've heard CBD is good for seizures. My dog's having seizures. I'm going to go and buy this and I don't need to worry or it would be wrong to start another drug or, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm worried about this other drug and this is a more natural 
product. So my worry is that that we're maybe yeah relying on it too heavily, at least to start with. I absolutely agree with that, Alex. I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of a big area of concern that the veterinary practicing community has towards pet parents who are interested in using cannabis, not because it's not an amazing modality, but this is something that my team works with a lot from the harm reduction education perspective. So both to colleagues and to pet parents, what you said now of cannabis has some amazing properties and is a really strong advocate for a lot of conditions. But if it jeopardizes an animal's health because a needed treatment is delayed, So saying cannabis is going to work, cannabis is going to work. And we really need some other pharmaceuticals on board or a surgery, something needs to happen. Or if a pet parent happens to see their animal improving, and I would say seizures is probably the number one case where we see this happen occasionally of the animals feeling so much better, much less anxious. They're not seeing seeing some of those preictal signs, but yet for that particular animal, their seizure pattern was a couple of months. And so the pet parent might pull off some of the anti-seizure meds, but cannabis isn't enough, or we don't have the molecular profile right enough to really control those seizures. And that can go really, really poorly for those animals end up in cluster seizures in the ER because we weren't really taking that holistic point of view. We were focusing too much on cannabis instead of what that animal actually, actually needed. So I agree. I think that delay of needed treatment or pulling off medication before it's appropriate are big concerns that I have all the time. Cannabis works beautifully with all of our medications that we know of so far. There's a couple that we're a little bit careful with, but as an adjunct, it's such a good supporter. And if the animal's able to come off some of those pharmaceuticals down the road, yes, that's amazing. But I always love starting with cannabis as an adjunct at, the, at, at first until we see what the body is going to do, until we let it tell us how much support it needs. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess pain would be another, you know, one of the classic kind of older yeah. dog or cat with arthritis is that that we we don't just treat with, you know, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, which a lot of people accuse us, but we look at weights, we look at diet, mm-hmm. we look at exercise, lifestyle, all that kind of thing. And and cannabis CBD can can play a role, a very absolutely. important role in that. And and that's absolutely one that once we get everything settled and and that initial crisis over if that's what's caused that presentation then absolutely we might be able to withdraw those anti-inflammatory medications and yeah just rely on everything else so you know what a fantastic situation to be in but if that dog tumbles down the stairs i'm probably going to put it back on non steroids and yet know that cannabis is supporting the health of the liver while it's on those other medications so it really is a beautiful conjunction it's it's a fun modality to work with yeah. So one um, accusation that I think um, you know gets thrown at a lot of vets, or or could be, and you could listen. Well, the vet's always going to say go to the vet because that's how they earn a living. But also, <laughs> you know, my vet's not talking to me about CPD. They're not talking to be to me about these cannabis products. So, you know, what's that all about? Because I'm yeah. I'm I'm reading all about this. I'm hearing today that it's a really exciting product that has you know got some proven benefits. So, why is my vet not talking to to me about it? Yeah, great question. We encounter a lot of frustration from both sides, both from the veterinary professional side and the pet parent side around this issue. But what I tell everyone first is that this entire industry just needs a lot of compassion each to each other because it's a really, really, really new industry. We've only known about the endocannabinoid system since 1980s. I mean, it's really, really new. And so it's hard for all of us to come into it and not have the same expectations that we do about our medical professionals understanding the GI tract or understanding how muscles work. The system in and of itself takes a while to figure out. And we're kind of just at that point now where we do know the receptors, we understand the endogenous molecules that our body makes, we understand how these exogenous molecules affect that system. So it is at a point where it is being able to be taught, being able to be given a CE. And then I think from the veterinary practitioner side, there's that strong tenet of do no harm. If you don't know about it, there's a potential that you could do harm and not knowing how it interacts with modalities that you're already familiar with opens up this big unknown. So from a practitioner perspective, many times will my colleagues will elect to not work with cannabis just because they don't want it to go poorly. They don't want it to go um, in the wrong direction or them say something bad or give bad advice. 
And that can be frustrating, but at the same time, there are starting to be a lot of resources, a lot of experts who will consult on cannabis, just like you would send out a pathology case and just get some expert opinion or an oncology case just to get some outside insight. Uh, And so that's really what we're trying to help with is not every veterinarian needs to be an expert in cannabis to be able to answer the questions that are coming from their pet parent. There are now lots and lots of resources and we can do this together. You know, we're all, we're all trying to figure it out at the same time. So I would love to see just a little bit less of that condemnation, both of self for the practitioner side and a lot more compassion towards all the different parties. We're, we're figuring it out together and there's still a lot of work to be done there. Yeah, that's not some underlying conspiracy that that vets no. are trying to destroy the cannabis <laughs> industry, which is no, don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but how can people, um, you know, maybe bring this conversation up with their vet? So they, you know, they they've got a vet that they trust, and that's fantastic. Something that I encourage so much, and not chopping and changing just because your current vet doesn't talk about it. How can how can yeah. people start that conversation with their vet without worrying about upsetting them or offending them? I I definitely would say approaching it with, can we do this together? Attitude makes it easier for both sides. If you are both figuring out the research, both thinking about what, what would be good for the animal patient that we're both caring a lot about, I think it brings down a lot of those, uh, trigger points for everybody. And it's much more likely to be a good productive conversation, really important, at least in the U S and particularly in Colorado is this aspect of the pet parent starting it. So the pet parent initiating the treatment because it's cannabis is available at every gas station here at every grocery store. So for a pet parent to say, I've made the decision that I want to use cannabis for my animal veterinary team. Can you help me do that safely? Help me figure out what I should do or shouldn't do what research is out there. What isn't, but the pet parent really acknowledging that they're taking that onus of I want my animal to be on cannabis. Then that really creates this atmosphere of safety for the veterinary team to practice in, especially if there's some weird legal policies or vague legal policies, really they can step in and say, great, I am going to help you make sure that your pet is safe. So I'm going to come at this from a harm reduction education perspective, talk about what should not be in your product. We don't want any pesticides, heavy metals. We don't want any of these contaminants. We don't want things like artificial sweeteners, xylitol. We don't want any of that in here. Let's look at some of the research studies. What doses were used there? Let's call some people that we can ask. And that immediately just changes the tone of the conversation where you're both in it together. So that's what, that's what I'd say. Start, start that conversation with your vet because it does need to be in that partnership. But recognize that we are all still learning and it's a huge learning curve for everybody. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think every treatment should be a, a partnership and a collaboration anyway. Yeah. So this is, this is no different. It's um, just one of the rest of them. Yeah, you touched on kind of the legal aspect. Are there, because I know that's a changing fluid situation as well. Um, Mm -hmm. Are there any restrictions? Is that dependent dependent on state of vets actually talking about these products? Um, You know, are there any, is there anything people need to consider like that? Yeah, by by now, it is very state and country dependent. Mm. Uh, A year or so ago, I could have told you a more broad swath of here's what everyone's doing, but now it's really a patchwork across the states of what policies are in place. So I will just say that it is the responsibility of the veterinary team to know what policies govern their area. Country, state, county, city, you can as you can see everyone have different policies. But it really does help when we approach it from the perspective of my pet parent is doing this. It's go, this, the substance is going in the animal. It's going into my patient. So I should figure out what that means from an oversight perspective. I cannot even necessarily deal with the cannabis part, but I can still make sure that organs are functioning as they should, that pain levels are going up or down. So that's always in the veterinarian's purview. And then it is going to be pretty dependent on where you're practicing here in Colorado. um, Even though we have both recreation and medical marijuana available and definitely a, a really big hemp market, there's still no prescribing of cannabis. And that's a really important thing, I think, for particularly pet parent um, individuals to know the prescription piece comes from, in the U.S. at least, having a DEA license. So allows us to prescribe pain medications and antibiotics, but it requires that the DEA also recognizes the molecules that we're working with. And it just it's just not a true thing for cannabis. And I could go into more details, but I'm not sure it's necessarily 
interesting <laughs> to, <laughs> to everyone out there. But essentially, it comes down to the fact that hemp is not regulated by the federal government and marijuana is a schedule one. And so that's why it comes to the dispensary. So it's a huge work in progress. Everything is very fluid, but it comes back to, it just has to be done in that collaborative partnership because it will differ from state to state. Yeah, absolutely. And it might be one reason why that's a, a reluctant to talk about it because it's, you know, you don't want to get on the wrong no, side of, of various um, yeah, agencies when you're yeah. dealing with dealing with products like, like this. So that uncertainty may lead to a, well, I've got treatments that I know work and that I've been using for years. So let's just, let's just kind of stay in my lane if you like. Yeah, absolutely. With, um, so, I mean, there's a whole load of information and I think we've covered an awful lot of questions that people would, would have and given some really important pointers for, for starting and for using this in, in dogs and cats. I wonder though, what the, cause I'm sh- with consulting with lots of different vets and seeing kind of this in lots of patients, I wonder what the most common mistakes you see that people make with using these products? Yeah, it, it is our privilege to consult across um, across all the states within the U.S., but do a lot of international consulting as well, which adds an element of challenge. The U.S. probably has the best testing of um, products so that I can know exactly what's in my products. I know exactly the major cannabinoids and the minor cannabinoids and the terpenes that are there, but a lot of our colleagues are practicing with products that we know some generalities of, but we don't really know the specifics. So when we get to consult across countries and across states, it means that it keeps us on our toes <laughs> in really being um, adaptive to whatever the question ends up being. But I will say that across all those geographic zones, the thing that I think I would love to tell every colleague of mine out there and every pet parent out there is it's, there is no recipe. There is no one size that fits all for cannabis because of what we talked about a few minutes ago, the endocannabinoid system changes from minute to minute. If you have two identical animals in, you know, in our research studies, we have identical mice that have been bred exactly the same and they've lived in the same environment. You can have completely different endocannabinoid systems between the two. If you and I are walking along and we both have healthy endocannabinoid systems and I trip and fall, within a couple of minutes, some of the receptors in my ECS are going to upregulate and sort of say, Hey, I'm have, there's inflammation here. I need help. The endocannabinoid system is this amazing interaction point between mammals and their environment. And so when we try to make a protocol that is very recipe, there's going to be 20 milligrams of CBD. There's going to be 20 milligrams of THC in this bottle. Then we're going to give it once a day. It It just doesn't work like we think it will, because that's a very pharmaceutically based mindset. Cannabis needs to be very flexible, very adaptable to whatever's going on in the patient's life at the moment. One of my favorite places to get pet parents to is for them to actually be comfortable using multiple products so that they can change it based on how the animal's feeling, maybe PM versus AM and different molecules that need to be in the mix. So I would say that is my, that is my top, top thing that I would say myth that needs to be dispelled is there's no recipe and it has to be a very, very individualized medicine for it to work well. Yeah. So give two drops twice a day is not a, yeah. Or, or if you're doing that, then then we're not kind of there, (laughs) but it it goes back to not, not getting the full benefit from these products. Um, you know, we need to be a little bit more flexible. So Dr. Kassara, I feel we've, we've covered a lot of ground, but I also feel we've only just vaguely scratched the surface um you know it's a wonderful time to be involved in in this area and what an exciting time to be a pet parent as well where can people go to to learn more because you've got a fun you've got fantastic resources available to people don't you I will say that probably our most popular resource is our consultation program, because that's really where most people are right now. I'm interested. I want to know more, but I want it for my animal. I have something that I want to use it for. And so that is kind of a mix of uh, education about what cannabis is, about endocannabinoid system, but also consulting on a particular case. And those are available both direct to pet parents, but also to veterinary professionals. So the point of that being dive in. Like it's such a fun medicine to work with. Look at your state policies, your country policies, make sure you know what you're doing there, but um, work on a case, especially to my veterinary colleagues. I would say, don't, don't worry about not knowing all, all the parts and pieces, pick a case that you feel like needs something extra that isn't just 
quite working and dive in with that. And then if you have that collaborative partnership with your pet parent, um, that's when you really start learning together and get to see the effects of the molecules on the animal. That's really what really starts to come come together for sure. So I would say probably through a consultation service lets us answer all the questions, figure out where people are, give them additional resources. Um, our specialists can give uh, papers if that kind of needs to be cited in the molecular profile. So hopefully that kind of helps. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's a yeah. lot of information out there. It's actually kind of hard to curate. A lot of people can get frustrated at that point. Oh, and once you've once you've got it up to date, it needs to be updated again. I'd, I'd yes, imagine. exactly. Next week, <laughs> it'll be old next week. <laughs> yeah. Um, and where can where can people go to get that consultation service? Uh, veterinarycannabis.org is where we will will post uh, education videos as they come up, uh, the consultation service, but also where people can just reach out for questions, um, especially if anyone's just feeling kind of lost or confused. Even if it's not us, we can point them in the right direction. CAVCM is the Canadian group. And then VCS, Veterinary Cannabis Society, are the two groups that you really start see forming from the nonprofit side. And they're really diving into the educational aspect. So I would also say that those are really great resources. Um, and then our website is veterinarycannabis.org. Wonderful. I'll leave all of those links in the show notes so people awesome. can jump onto them, dive into some, you know, some reliable information because that's, you know, something that can be very difficult to come by separating fact from fiction. So Dr. Kasara, thank you for your time today. Thank you for helping to spread the message of this, you know, potentially wonderful product that's going to benefit the lives of so many pets. And yeah, I look forward to, to hearing what the future brings. Absolutely. Thanks, Alex. Now, if you're looking for a high quality CBD option to give your dog, then checking out the products at CBDMD and I'll leave links down below. They provide a certificate of analysis for every product on every product page, as well as having a QR code on the label so you can check each batch is safe and includes what they claim it does. So check out those products. And if you're interested in learning how CBD could fit in with a pain management or arthritis treatment plan, then make sure you check out this other video linked on screen. So I'll see you over there. But until next time, I'm veterinarian Dr. Alex. This is Our Pets Health, because they're family.